BBJ. And today we do our live um, page through review of Salt and Wounds. So what the hell is Salt and Wounds? Um, let me begin with this. Unkillable, regenerating kaiju, the Tarrasque rampaging through the countryside. The solution, several kingdoms launch a combined army led by 13 heroes, each equipped with ballistas armed with immovable harpoons to bind and slay the beast. Despite heavy losses, the army is successful and the mighty creature is bound in a high mountain valley, yet still cannot be killed. So defenders start disbanding, they're low on food, and to feed the populace, the newly built fortresses turn to butchering and eating the terrace for rations. War with native stone giants ends with enslaving the tribes and their labor is used to upgrade the fortification, building the salt of wounds city. The heroic binder lords of days old left behind 13 um, aristocratic houses to control the city, the symbol of their power laying in their knowledge of the command words that can unleash the harpoons holding the beast. Waves of immigrants fleeing famine have made the city one of the most populous in the world, and alchemists experimenting with Tarrasque-derived reagents have driv further driven its economy to thrive. Only the 12th Meridian Crisis, where the titanic monstrosity's tail briefly became unstuck and caused destruction of a section of the city, the tails, Tailstones, has caused major catastrophe in the settlement's recent history and the current year of 277 AB, or after binding. The city of Salt and Wounds has blossomed into a weird, evil metropolis built around the perpetual butchery of the Tarrasque. So, uh, Salt and Wounds is a campaign setting built around the idea of, well, a rampaging Tarrasque, <laughs> uh, essentially. Um, it is a city that is uh, part and parcel um, a an idea that many of us have had as world building, and which is why I'm a fan of it. Um, it's the idea of taking like something small, well, Tarrasque is really small, but taking a small idea like, hey, I wonder if, if people bred, you know, rust monsters, what would the world be like? If beholders took over the world, what would the world be like? You know, um, and of course this idea is, is uh, what would happen if a Tarrasque rampaged through, uh, through the countryside in this particular setting. Now, the campaign guide is not about the entire world. It is about the city of salt and wounds. And we'll get into why, like what the hell is with the name salt and wounds and all that kind of business. But, uh, oftentimes, you know, as players, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, but Deadman says, uh, this sounds like a, uh, like a part of the Exalted campaign, a giant creature that was attacked and laid low in ancient times, and the city was built in the creature's corpse with flesh being cut away regularly. Yeah, it sounds like a, like an Exalted thing, like a, um, it's, it, it sounds horrific, yet, like, well above and beyond um, like mortal kin kind of thing. Vince's as I call my crust monster buddy, Crunchy. <laughs> yeah. So this idea of, you, you know, player characters are like, hey, I want to kill a Tarrasque, but Tarrasque, but the, what's really great about role-playing games is the, are consequences. What happens if this thing really existed? So, and, and taking it and extrapolating anything and everything you can about it, you know, if there's a Tarrasque that the PCs have to fight, what was it doing prior to the PCs even hearing about it or obtaining the levels that it took to, to even put up a fight against it, et cetera. So that's what this is about. So I'm gonna say, I'm going to uh, share my screen here and uh, we will dive into it. Share screen and we get the infinite. There we go. Um, hopefully you guys are seeing this, uh, seeing my screen. Uh, please tell me you're seeing my screen. Um, let me know if you're not, uh, because I really want you to see it. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. Mm -mm -mm. Sorry. 
All right, so uh, here we have the front cover, and let's see if you if you can really see this. Uh, I'm going to use the cursor to uh, to show this at the top, right above the title "Salt and Wounds Campaign Setting." You you're going to see to the left these images. They look like birds, maybe vultures or ravens or some kind of carrion bird. And if your eye slides to the middle, right above the word "in." you're going to see these spines and that is the body the head the the top um uh spinal ridge of the tarasque uh, vince says there's lots of things i never understood about dnd settings the most obvious one would be how do people survive without heroes with all those monsters around yeah and this this setting definitely uh delves into that yeah what the heck happened okay there we go so um, right above that, you can see that there's this uh, Tarrasque. And as we page down in this cover, there's like, uh, there's, <laughs> I, I would call it a fish market. You can see like the meat market, right? There's a there's giant walls holding the creature in and there's people walking around selling their wares and such. And essentially it has gotten to the point where it's become a regular thing. You know, it there's, uh, it's strange how humanity can become comfortable with some some quite horrific things in in and around them, and this happens to be it. Like a war torn, uh, a place that's a war torn region. This is the exact same thing, except there's the the Tarrasque. So of course we have the campaign uh, setting. Uh, this one is there is both a fifth edition and a Pathfinder edition of the setting guide, and although the setting guide has been released there are plenty of uh, rules going through play testing right now so this isn't the complete version of it of the uh, salt and wounds isn't the complete version of it this is just a portion now i will tell you <laughs> yeah Ben says what what is today on the menu hmm tasty tasty age old tarasque flesh yeah and it's not just hey it's not just the flesh there's like there's certain cuts that are actually better than others um there's the use of the flesh. There's the use of the bone. Uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty nasty. All right. So and I'm sorry. Um, this uh, book is by J M Perkins. We have additional writing by uh, people such as a uh, uh, Jesse Drake, John Pio, Doug Easterly. We have additional writers who are um, helping to uh, bring this to life, uh, editing. So right here we have ourselves um, uh, the editing, the cover art, interior art, and additional art. Uh, Mike Myler, uh, uh, Jeffrey Chen, there's some great artwork in here. There's some stock, stock art that has been used as well. So yeah, and of course, product identity. Now, then we have ourselves a table, um, table of contents. Uh, this is a hundred page setting guide. So it's primarily fluff. And I, I say that because there are there's some ruling rules and rulings in here, but you'll see it. So it's um, how to handle sensitive subjects because it, essentially, this is an evil city, or at least a decadent one, uh, with quite a bit of br br brutality. Considering the fact that there's like this, um, you know, I don't know, thousand ton or larger kaiju being cut up to, to be used for its flesh. So you, you, you know, you kind of have to, you know, put that aside um, if if you want to live here. And there's a life, uh, life insult and wounds. They talk about a, a bunch of the races that are. Uh, available here, um, festivals, calendars, uh, the uses of, of its flesh, and then of course the locations, districts and places um, in and around it. So we'll get to that. Uh, Vince says, uh, first uh, interesting thing, ghoul, ghoul PCs. Yes, there are ghoul PCs. There's actually a whole ghoul uh, racial and cultural makeup here. <laughs> Vince says mites. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty nasty. Um, Remember, the kaiju is like being butchered eternally. Now, some of you may who are brand new to fifth edition will un, will know that the the current Tarrasque does not regenerate. Although in its history, you will know that it constantly comes back. In earlier editions of fourth edition, three point XX, um, I'm not sure if it showed up in second edition. Don't believe so. Um, that the kaiju had the ability to regenerate like a, uh, you know, like a troll. And so as this kaiju is being butchered over and over again, like um, it's being, okay, 
The blood is pouring out of it. It's seeping into the ground. It's it's basically corrupted the groundwater. Uh, it's corrupted the soil. There are there are creatures that are subterranean creatures that have actually climbed toward the surface, and there there are the uh, the god butchers who have to get rid of the things trying to grow inside of it where people can't reach it, basically like maggots. But the mag because the kaiju is so big. You know, ghouls and mites are essentially its own type of maggots, um, as well as like giant sturges and other things that can eat off of the body. It's pretty, pretty nasty. So, uh, well, <laughs> Vince says uh, the kaiju is a, is a kaiju. The, I mean, excuse me, the Tarask is a kaiju. Um, well, it's not canon, but it, but it fits. Now we need giant robots. Yeah, it's it's a it's our modern day reference to what is a giant creature right and the easiest way to describe it is like basically kaiju right it's it's the it's the godzilla of the dnd world um what i'm doing now is paging through the sensitive uh subject pages uh dealing with the fact that this is an evil city and and there are things in it um there's quite a quite a num a bit of corruption and so yeah you're gonna have a lot of that um wow Spelljammer had robots in second edition. I didn't remember that. Oh man, mm, gotta pick up some uh, Spelljammer books. That, that that was my jam right there. Uh, anyway, um, Dead Man the Storyteller says that. So, um, of course, the the beginning. It's it seems kind of odd to have to put this all the time in a lot of books, but this happens to be an issue about dealing with conflict and sensitive issues and not going too far and that kind of thing. Uh, right here is Salt Moons at a Glance. This is what I read earlier today. Um, <laughs> yeah. Azala says the king's castle has become animated. Um, something like that in this in, in this particular setting, but yeah, there's there are um ideas about that. Now, there are prominent factions and districts here, um, which is pretty cool. So just to give you an idea of how expansive the city has become that's built around it, um, there are the uh, Meridian Houses, which are like decadent aristocrats who control the city and constantly vie for power. The Meridian Houses are built around the 13 Meridians are built off of the 13 heroes that put down the Tarrasque after it rampaged for, you know, for a generation. And while this, this setting guide does not describe the rest of the world, you get the idea that uh, the Tarrasque basically rampaged long enough to cause like destruction, famine. It basically brought down society around it. And so the city of salt in wounds has become the uh, epicenter of like a uh, culture and uh, economy and that kind of thing. So despite the fact that there's many people who would prefer it not to be, it is a location that's like, it's it, it's the, here in the States, it's like the Las Vegas or like the Hollywood, the New York of, of the world. Um, so the title Salt in Wounds is a modification of the name of the fortress that was built around the Tarrasque called Saul in Wounds. Um, Saul Lin's Wuin is the title, and so it just became known as Salt and Wounds. Um, so th those are Meridian Houses. There are the God Butchers. Uh, the God Butchers are the ceremon ceremonial order of night butchers who carve up the Tarrasque. It's their job, basically, to, to co continually kill it, ensure that it doesn't awaken or rip in out any of the harpoons, and to divvy up the, basically... Uh, the skin, the blood, the brains, and things of that nature. Uh, there are the Marrow Miners, which are a new organization. The Marrow Miners are kind of a criminal organization um, that work on the Tarrasque. They found it after the 12th Meridian Crisis, where the tail got loose and basically smashed up part of the city. And they have yet to really rebuild that part of the city. Uh, Vince says, isn't that the German word for salt, salz, used in there? Yes, it is. It's, it's literally S-A-L-Z. I W U U N Saul's in Wuhan. I'm probably butchering the name of the 
with the word, but whatever. It, it's, it's fictional anyway, so I can't really ruin something that doesn't exist. Um, so there's uh, Enders. The Enders are the extinct faction. They intended to kill the beast. No one's been able to kill it yet. Uh, there are the house militias, which are like the law enforcement, but they're broken up in 13 different groups. So they're all loyal to their own Meridian houses. Um, there's even like... Um, uh, the Circle of Release, which is a Druidic insurgency trying to free the, the Tarask. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Vince. Um, there's the Church of Mass Infects, which worships the god of butchers. There's the Church of the Monad, which are academics and alchemists who believe in the supreme unity of all things, i.e. Uh, using its blood and um, uh, internal fluids to create alchemical potions. Um, uh, Vincent says, uh, salt and wound would be Sauls in wood in, in German. Uh, and it could be that it was a modification of that. Like, you know, sometimes sometimes we like to do like our Google foo. So I can imagine that's probably where it came from, um, as in Sauls in wound, woo, wound, as in, as opposed to wound, den. Um, there's a solid, 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 dia, sir, septermis. Solidea Septermis. Anyway, that's the religion that believes wealth is God. There's the faith of um, Menesic, which is the worship of the God of mutations. Uh, there's there's things like that. Um, and there's uh, districts such as the Beast Crown, which is like the um, arist aristocratic district, Sage's Row, uh, the Throat, the Tailstones. And let's see if I can accent this here, Sauls and Wuin. Uh, right here, the fortress core that holds the Tarrasque and um, inaccessible by the public. So there's basically a, a, a fortress built around it. And oh, oh, there's Heart's Blood Marsh. It's a mutant fungal swamp crafted from twisted druidic magic that pr processes uh, Tarrasque runoff like it was a uh, chemical waste. So there's a, <laughs> there's, a, there's a druidic cult that believes that the Tarrasque is part of nature. So that's that's kind of strange there. Uh, there's general information here about uh, food is cheap, but clean water is extremely expensive, uh, basically because of the blood runoff. Um, there's horrifying drugs, mutations, monsters, crime, and torture are all common. Law enforcement is, is not. Uh, there's slavery here as well, uh, indentured servitude is also, weather is an idiosyncratic, nearly tropical climate amongst snow-covered mountains, uh, essentially because of the heat it released from the constant uh, killing and regenerating of the creature. So it, it, the, the creature kind of was cornered a, um, near a mountain crest, probably hoping the heroes would know that the Tarrasque would have trouble crossing the mountain range. And basically when the creature was killed, it kind of created a swampy area. Um, the stone giants that lived in the mountains were just like, hey, hell guys, like, don't, please don't kill, don't, oh, you know, they, they give a big, big middle finger, like, why did you have to, you know, try to kill this creature right here? And of course, uh, as people are wont to do, they were like, uh, hey, your ass ain't sitting back, you're, you're helping us build a fortress. So they got the stone giants to help them build, uh, i.e. enslaving them. Uh, and killing off the ones that didn't help. So yeah, there's that. Uh, most normal water drinking um, animals are considered luxuries. Uh, axe beaks and other birds or lizards take their place. So people ride around in axe beaks, ride on the back of axe beaks and lizards. Uh, ghoulification is legal and ghouls are citizens, eating a prestigious amount of rotting Tarrasque flesh to stay sane. Uh, and then paladins, rangers, and druids are generally unwelcome in the city, often operating covertly. Uh, because basically paladins, rangers, druids, like the, many of them have this idea that, oh, I don't know, we should stop killing the, you know, hacking at the Tarrasque. And so the city is just like, wait a minute, this is our, this is our economy, you know, dude, get out. So um, Vince says, I like what they did with the setting. Just thinking the base concept though, I wonder if there are baby Tarasks in there. Maybe it was pregnant. Wha okay, Vin really, seriously, Vince, you're gonna get that far ahead of me? <laughs> and I'll, I'll be for real, like, wait, you've already, you see, you're already, you, you have jumped well ahead because there's a part of this book that talks about secrets. And one of the secrets is the Tarask is pregnant and maybe laying some little baby tracks and right. So of course in your mind, you're thinking, okay, 
how valuable are they? Should they be killed? Would somebody try to steal? <laughs> this is, I swear I didn't read it yet. Um, you, you know, that brings up all kinds of ideas. Would there be a criminal organization that would want to steal one? Maybe there's a country, uh, one of the nations that was destroyed that says, hey, if we get our own, we can make, we can actually grow it. Um, you know, that, I mean, what would happen if you enslave it? And turn it into like a weapon of mass destruction, or you could, or you can make your other city like if this is if this is the United States version of Las Vegas. Someone else is like, hey, I want to make my own version of like Miami or New York. We can pin and grow our own terrasse and start cutting out, cutting at it. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of things, right? So, I mean, maybe there's a Druidic or Ranger cult that's like, hey, let's grow this thing and let it go wild, and you know because it's. A natural part of our society, it should destroy everything, right? Um, Azala, of course, says, you know, quote, life uh, finds a way. That's absolutely right. So, approaching the city, this describes everything that you see when you're approaching the city, where there's things like oddities and, and the culture and and whatnot. Um, people who live on the outside of the city who want to, you know, make a buck and they want to get inside. Uh, there's mutations, there's a bunch of sick people who, uh, you know, unfortunately are trying to drink off of the nasty runoff water that's like called the Red River. Um, most of those people end up getting sick and dying and there's quite a bit of disease. There's a ton of carrion creatures that that fly around it, and the god butchers are having an extremely tough time keeping them away. Uh, there's there's all kinds of things. Uh, Vince says, I mean, there are tons of questions. You could try to reproduce the regenerative abilities and use it to graft its body parts on people or create healing potions. D absolutely, you know, creating armies or assassins or something. Um, Vince says, I, I assume great minds think alike. <laughs> I'm so modest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. It, there's, there's a ton of this stuff. So, um, so th this portion basically is like this breakout box is basically like, okay, if you're, you're approaching the city, this is what you see. Here's the timeline of the Tarask, um, before the binding BB, which is before binding and AB, which is after binding, um, 117 years ago, um, the Tarask re-emerges after a period of hibernation and procedures of rampage for over a century. All attempts at stopping it fail. So, it, it, you know, if you want to include this location in your setting, um, you, you could basically say, hey, the Tarask went around, destroyed a bunch of stuff, but things were rebuilt and these heroes destroyed it, right? Um, uh, Azala says, a scientist using a Tarask to craft on body parts and then turn it into mutant uh, half Tarask monsters, of course. Uh, Vince says you could have guys who want to transform themselves into a Tarrasque race or something. Yeah, th dude, there's all of that in here. Not to mention the fact that um, there's weapons made out of the bone. There's uh, armor made out of the scale. There are like all kinds of like drug, drug addicted potions, like drug addicted addiction styled potions where they give you great strength, regenerative abilities. It's all, all kinds of crap. So here we go with the, the God Butchers, um, Mar um, Heart's Blood Marsh, where that came from, the Clearwater Accords, where they had to bring in um, clean water into the city, you know, trade and, and, and the population booms, the Night Cleavers, the Meridian Crisis, the Marrow Miners, um, it's all kinds of things. Uh, the the Aphrodini merges with the fungal sieve. It's it's bizarre. So here we have a a uh, a map of the city, the spillway, the throat uh, locations. <laughs> uh, Rickards, uh, um Johansson says, uh, "Dragonborn not tied to dragons, but to Tarask." Yeah, absolutely. Who who's to say that that's not a thing, right? Dragonborn or hell, even dragons. Um, I'm not sure if the Tarasque is an aberration or not, but who who cares? It's your world, right? That that would, that would be sweet. Um, here's the Beast Crown. I know it's sideways, guys, um, but if you can take a look, the city is built up, and then you see this round portion where the Tarasque is at, and located around the Tarasque are 13 giant ballistas with magical harpoons that are manned um, day and night so that if the creature starts to move, they can harpoon it down again. And then there are command words, each command word given to the 13 Meridian houses. 
and each of those command words can be basically someone can say, you know, release, and then that harpoon will release. So it would take, well, I'm assuming that it doesn't take the release of all 13 command words, but I'm sure five or six command words and the thing probably will rip, rip out. Uh, Sage's Row, the Tailstones, Beast Crown, um, yeah. It's the, uh, Vincent says a Tarasque is a gargantuan monstrosity titan and it's unaligned. And then here we have, uh, of course, we have some flavor text, some stories. Um, there's a ton of corruption. So there's, there's a, a lot of like cell swords, assassins, that kind of thing. So you have some stories here. Uh, they talk about the races in Salt and Wounds. Um, humans, half elves, their position. Uh, half elves are like brokers, basically. Um, elves can give a middle finger to this place. Um, uh, is, Dwarves are rare. Uh, essentially, they're like hornsmiths and blood merchants, the few that are here. There's a lot of underworld creatures that have like come up from under the ground that are trying, you know, the, the god butchers are trying to eliminate them. Half orcs are huge here, uh, basically used as shock troops, and they've just <laughs> given birth, and it, it, it's kind of like their thing. Um, in a way, it, this city has a lot of racism in it as well. So that's a sensitive subject. So yeah, there's a lot of racial tension because you know how orcs are treated, how halflings are treated. Uh, gnomes are a big deal here because of their skill with uh, al alchemy and creating like clockwork things. Halflings are huge here. Halflings are basically, um, <laughs> as Allah says, half orcs are common, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, half orcs are huge, orcs and half orcs. Halflings were slaves. There's there's a little line here that I love um, where it comes to the to the uh, halflings. Um, halflings are assumed to basically be slaves, even if they're free. But it says this is especially troubling for halfling um, courtiers of the thirteenth house, the so-called people's house, which was founded by a Rexony Bramblethumb, a teenage halfling servant who stepped into place to accurately fire the final immovable harpoon when her master fled. So I, I like that little, I like those little things like, yeah, there was a, guess what guys, um, ha a halfling was like basically the hero of this whole story and you're still considering them to be slaves. Like, yeah, that's pretty friggin' racist. Uh, to, to think you're like, yeah, you're not heroes, even though you were. Um, Vincent says, gnomes are common, sign me up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't forget ghouls. Ghouls are, are a playable race and they are legal citizens, uh, which is kind of nasty. And they, they live off of, um, you know, drink the trask blood, um, eat its flesh to remain, uh, to remain sane. So it is, the idea is that basically the ghouls that we normally, the quote, air quotes, regular ghouls are, um, they are the insane ghouls that we slaughter in a regular D and D world, but given enough flesh for them to eat, they're actually quite civil. So yeah, um, they are a a race here. Uh, tieflings make up a significant portion of the city's population, yet um, almost none are born within the metropolis. So uh, many of them have come here from from outside, either as like you know maybe they were ordered to come here because they were warlocks. Um, maybe some of them were kicked out of uh, out of the other cities um, for, you know, knowingly or not knowingly be being part of the Tarasque's rampage. You know, people like to blame, again, racism, right? Uh, you you look evil. Tarasque killed, destroyed my house. You have horns like the Tarasque. F you, right? That, that's that's a thing. Um, Agogi um, are, are uh, here in the city. A dragonborn, talk about dragonborn, orcs, um, uh, Gripley, which I think they're frog people, and Agogi are, I think they're s snake people? Shit, I can't remember. Um, uh, the Tarasque isn't a sentient creature, but you could claim that people are like cannibals. So yeah, there's a bit of that. Um, yeah, Agogi and Gripley. I know the Gripley are frog people. Uh, Agogi or maybe Ajoji? Agoji? A jogi, <laughs> just coming up with pronunciations. Um, I, I'm not familiar with the at all with the the agogi or the ajoji. Um, Gripplies I know are frog people. Uh, I I don't know what where they're written up at. Like they're, they're not in a basic book. I'm not sure where they are. Um, uh, uh, Dwigar, 
Dwegar, I believe is a pronunciation I've heard before. Duergar, uh, deep gnomes are are common here because uh, they're evil. Uh, mites, mites are um, like the spiteful. They're like the gremlins of this world in, in this setting. So yeah, um, Salt and Moon's calendar. So we went through the timeline and showed the calendar festivals, um, so, such as the Binders Glory, uh, Glowing Day, Unity Day. Uh, work industry and economy of salt and wounds. So they talk about the meat, um, the horn, which is basically the literally the horn and the also considered the bone. So the uh, and some of the skin is used considered the horn and the hardest portions of the Tarask. Um, uh, Rickard says uh, the ghouls remind me of a, a a bit of Fallout. I haven't played Fallout, but yeah, the the the, the ghouls are not in this setting. The ghouls are not like mindless raging, like I'm just gonna eat dead flesh, right? They're, they are citizen and and quite, you know, uh, civil. Um, Vince says, I did read a bit when you had the page open. Agogi are large altruistic brute lizard people. Oh, it makes sense, makes sense. Cause they, they would eat, they probably eat the flesh whole. They wouldn't even chew it. Uh, here's a, here's a really good piece of artwork here. Um, probably detailing using whatever language this, uh, is, although this technically could be common, um, detailing the parts of the creature and its use, um, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it kind of reminds me of like one of those um, uh, butcher's, butcher's charts. If you go into a, um, you, know, you see the cow or pig or something and you see the butcher butcher's chart. So yeah, a nice piece of artwork there. I like that. Like that a lot. Um, yeah, the best cuts. Ooh, nasty. Um, but here we're still with the economy to talk about scale, using the scales, alchemy and medicine, magic items and banking. Banking is big here, is big here in the city because it has become the financial center of this world. Um, so if you wanted to <laughs> to rasp tenderloin, <laughs> oh, oh nasty. Oh my goodness. Um, salt and wounds and water, uh, again. There is the Clearwater Accords, which created the Clearwater Aqueduct Project, which brings water from hundreds of miles away. So it's one of the one of the few, other than of course killing the Tarask over and over again, it's one of the few um, major industries that everyone donated money to to help it, help create it. But of course, this created yet another problem, which is the people who control the aqueduct control the water source. So everything is for sale here. Everything has a price in this city. It's pretty nasty. <laughs> 10 delicacies of salt and wounds, marsh stew, all color pudding, ugh. master's tongue, um, um, ambergris, rat crunch, uh, bladed bake up. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. <laughs> There's bread, of course, uh, sweet meat jerky, five roast and Tarasque sash. Um, Vince says it bring uh, as a question, which brings up the most important question: Can the quest inside? Can you quest inside the terrace to gather rare cuts? Uh, I would say yes. You'd probably have to battle the the god butchers. Um, although I tend to think that this setting deals less with actually standing and physically in front of the terrace more or less navigating the city around the terrace. But I would say, yeah, hell yeah. You know, going in there, <laughs> stealing rare cuts and sneaking out the city, uh, sneaking out, sneaking back out a back door. Yeah, oh yeah, hell yeah. Or paying people off and going in, because <laughs> that's what they're looking for. Heck yeah. Um, uh, water dens are a big thing, um, like uh, smoking dens or hookah, hookah dens. There's our, there are water dens because the water is so, so nasty. Um, yeah. Oh, Vince says it would be it would be so um so in if they had an inside map of the kaiju. Yeah, it would be kind of, that would be kind of cool. They I don't believe there is one, and I'm not. Sh they don't really tell you how big the Tarask is. Some people think the Tarask is like, well, how, okay, let's see. Some people think the Tarask is only as big as maybe a ten story building, whereas others are thinking like it's larger than a 100 story building. Um, I believe that's probably just based on your own experience with it. I get I get the impression that this is like a 100 story plus, like this is a um, uh, cruise liner and larger size, right? Uh, 
That's what I'm thinking. Uh, as I said, I had a DM who had it um, so that if a piece of a creature with regeneration was cut off, that piece would then grow to a clone of it. Who's to say that's not true in this this setting, right? Um, all the people growing or having little uh, seeds inside of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, it's pretty nasty. Talk about the weather. Um, there's a hazard section, page 78 to 90. Um, they talk about the terrifying Black Sundays and that kind of things. There's a like a nasty kind of slurry, uh, especially when the rains and um, snows and rain fall on a mountainside and then they run down through the city, running the, the, the blood and gristle um, away and down into the um, uh, hearth's blood um, marsh. It's pretty nasty. So um, now, now here we go with the mindset, Salt and Moon's mindset. And a lot of this is basically like, you know, everyone out for themselves. Uh, they people are industrious. Uh, it's considered a faux pas to be scared when the Tarask like shifts and breathes and tries to release itself. Like people are used to it shaking the city every once in a while. And if you're new to the city, like it's a it's a panic situation, and they look at you like, oh, you must be from outside. Like you're an outsider. You aren't salted. So there there actually is a slang here where we talk about people being salted uh where if you're salted you're just used to it like you just go to go to bed and you're just rocked to sleep by the sound of the tarasque breathing heavily that kind of thing uh there's a uh, examples of crimes and punishment um being mutilated is a type type of punishment so there's like um execution or truncation you know Conspiring to end the terrace binding is punishable by truncation, and truncation is like getting your arms and legs cut off. Um, magical creation or an unauthorized import of water. Uh, maiming or assault, you know, can be branding or up to two points of maiming. Um, murder is, you know, punishable by execution, uh, which is funny because it says murder is punishable by execution, and there's, al there's always murder, right? It's, <laughs> you just got to get caught. Um, Propagandizing is basically speaking against the city. Um, run, runaway slaves are, um, you know, punished punished by branding, flogging, and a point of maiming. And it talks about what maiming is: um, use of al um, alchemy and things like that, theft, smuggling, that kind of thing. Now, of course, there's a bunch of, of punishable crimes, right? And it's first you got to get caught, and second, someone has to punish you. So, yeah. Uh, Vince says a cruise ship is about 150 feet. Yeah, Deadman says in 2E D and D it was 80 feet long, and 3E it changed to 150 feet. So I'm, I'm thinking this is pretty darn big. Um, yeah, uh, coins of salt and wounds, language and slang. So there's like um, Burke, there's Divot Job, uh, know the pain of one stack, uh, last cuts or last Wednesday's, Wednesday's cuts, um, salted that kind of thing, tip job. <laughs> uh, twelfty or twelfth man <laughs> is an insult. That kind of thing. So yeah, and then um, uh, terms for coins. So there's a spike, scale, bone, and horn are the the titles for the copper, silver, gold, and platinum pieces in the city. There's a morality. You talk about the morality, and and this is the one that this is really where it goes into the so-called evil of the city. Um, and it, it, the first line of it is, salt and wounds is an evil place. Uh, you know, while the binding of the Trask is, is perhaps necessary, the city has been built upon its callous torture with no current legitimate efforts to minimize its suffering. The evils of slavery are regarded as commonplace with regular arguments as to the rightness of owning slaves or how it can even be uh, better for them. So, it, it, it came out of necessity and then people just grown up with it. And now no one wants to break that mold. Right. Because it keeps them in power. Uh, you know, why destroy a good thing? You know, it's 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 the back to Las Vegas again. Right. It's the the, the, the you know, the city of sin exists so that people can go there. But now that it exists, no one's ready to take it down, despite how, you know, despite corruption or, um, you know, it, introducing, you know, horrific things like. I don't know, making ghouls a citizens is kind of nasty, right? Any other place in the world. Um, Vincent says, would it be, would be neat if they would not use actual coins, but water as currency? Uh, yeah, it, I, maybe they thought about that. Uh, but yes, I, I would absolutely think that water, 
especially like clean water could be used as currency, although you can be punished for bringing in clean water because there's a, a clean water guild. Um, you know, so <laughs> yeah, that that would be pretty interesting to have like the 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 water. I don't know. There would be like fights for over clean water, or who has it, or people smuggling it in, um, it, or it maybe a magical way to like have coins of water, bricks of water. Hmm, be kind of cool. Um, this talks about the fortress of Solin Wuin, um, Solzin Wuin. And it talks about the the, the God Butchers, the, the 12th Meridian Crisis, goes into that, uh, talks about the the um, the harpoons that are set up around it, um, the platforms, um, who is in charge of cutting up the beast. Yeah, water exchangers. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, there's notable locations and there's different gates to get into the beast. So there's like the prime gate, there's giant's gate. That's where the, of course the stone giants can come in and out um, who are of course enslaved or treated like slaves, indentured servants maybe, I guess would be the better way to, to, to think of it. Um, butcher's gate, butcher's hall, the carnal sluice grates, the ballistas themselves, uh, the, the 12th gate, um, the, the 12th gate is after the 12th Meridian crisis was destroyed. So they had to rebuild it, but like the marrow miners, which is like a criminal organization, um, kind of use that gate to get in and out basically. Darius Jana. Hey, <laughs> how's life in the Tarask? <laughs> yeah. Um, powderized water, just add water. <laughs> yeah. Just add what's up Darius. Um, Oh man. Donald Duck, wait a minute. Okay, Vince says, in a Donald Duck adventure, they had pills that if you cut in half would spray large amounts of water outside. I think they were invented by um, Gyro Gear Loose. <laughs> yeah, that, that could be a thing, right? Like little balls or orbs of like water that you could carry around with you. Um, just put them in a sack and eat one. And it's just a, you know, uh, like a gallon of water or something. Um, the Tailstones is where um, the 12th Meridian crisis happened. And it's basically like the, it's it's the the hub of criminal criminality because that part of the city was destroyed when the tail got loose and so there and it hasn't been rebuilt because you know why would I spend my money rebuilding somebody else's part of the city that's their own fault. Um, there's notable locations in the tailstones, uh, the pewter cup. Uh, that's so that you know people don't smash each other with their fine um, fine cups because they're you know pewter is soft. Um, Rega's stir fry, <laughs> Gothmork's grub hub. Kind of crazy. Um, Kutu Lampy, uh, the Shifting Place, which is um, the Temple of um, Renesic, which is the Lord of Mutation. Uh, here, there's a Sage's Row and a bunch of places like Testing Field, the Second Bits, the, the Flask of Inspiration, which is like a, um, a business, the Temple of Reason. There's a ton of, uh, of places here that it just sparks so many ideas. Uh, the Beast Crown District, which is like for the the, the aristocrats, the the well off, the people who have get the the finest cuts of meat, um, the best cuts of horn, um, that kind of thing. Uh, the richest locations, notable locations in the Beast Crown are the uh, Chine Hall Stage Courts for you know entertainment, Blackstone Well. I think that's. I'm going to assume that's either a um, an an agogi or an ajoji. A uh, music player. It could be Dragonborn, but I'm thinking a, a, a Gogi. Um, there's the Manor Towers. There's a location called the Throat, uh, located directly outside of um, Salzenwuin, and that is basically where all the commerce is happening. That's where the the market, the meat market, is at. High throat, core throat, low throat. Notable notable locations, of course, like the Scales. And the sword, the um, Herald's Tavern, Scorn's Ironworks, which is a uh, dwarven forge that uh, specializes in steel because many places use the horn uh, and bone for weapons inside, including the god butchers, right? The god butchers uh, use the actual bone of the creature to actually cut away at it. Uh, there are locations outside the city, of course, the spillway, it's pretty nasty, um, Hearts Blood Marsh, uh, the Cap Caps. The feathered saddle. The cap caps are the the tunnels underneath the Tarask, where a lot of the blood and the, the viscera like have been seeping into. And so there's a problem with underworld creatures climbing up towards it. Um, baby purple worms, um, mites, oh, some other subterranean creatures that are coming up to feed on it and um, being increased in size by it. Um, 
Vincent says, it's, um, it is weird. You could use a very simple sign language to navigate the city just by pointing at your own body parts. Hey, that might, that might be a thing, right? Hey, I'll meet you at the, and then you, you, you kind of use like a body language where you point to yourself to show where you're going to like meet, or maybe there's like a resistance. Maybe there are paladins and rangers and druids that are like resistance fighters using that as this like sign language, like, Hey, at three o'clock high, we're going to meet here. Um, that might be a thing too. You know, I'll meet you at the head. I'll meet you at the throat and visitors might not understand what that means. Uh, pool of all forms, 15 miles southeast of the city is a hidden cave. And, uh, you know, high rock altar, verdant fields, pretty nasty, even, even as far as 15, 30 miles away. Um, salt and wounds in the wider world. Uh, it says, note that salt and wounds is designed to be largely standalone, isolated campaign city with the ability to support a whole campaign without adventurers journeying beyond its environs. Uh, the metropolis is also designed to be modular and with relative ease, GMs should be able to place the metropolis right into their favored uh, game world. A good rule of thumb is to simply select an out of the way valley amidst the mountains, preferably somewhere one might imagine daring heroes trying to lure and ambush the Tarrasque and salt and wounds can easily fit there. The city's unique feature makes it uh, able to function more or less anywhere with minimal or extreme socioeconomic influence on the wider world. Uh, it can even be a semi-legendary bubble city, widely believed to be fantasy. So, uh, and that's basically like, if you want to in include this in your world, you can, because basically it's a giant city with um, stuff like dripping off the back end of it. So you could make this like a, a fantasy city, like people don't know that it still is there, or you can make it a big um, metropolis. So here we have people and factions, and, and I'm going to go right quick through this because there's a ton of it. Uh, I don't even know what page we're on. Uh, so th these are all the, the meridian houses, the, the, you know, and this goes into each of the 13 meridians and their symbols, um, pictures, notable members, uh, what their purpose is. Uh, each of the meridians are basically founded by one of the 13 heroes and it basically tells you what they are. So let me stop here at the sixth meridian. They are militant warriors, militant warriors with expansionist dreams and internal uh, schisms, right? So it tells you, it, it, it tells you, explain their, their purpose or their mantra, basically. Um, <laughs> Vincent, are there rainbow, ra random tables in there yet? Did not see enough of those. No, um, haven't gotten there yet. And mind you, this this series is not finished. So I'm going to presume a lot of the playtest material is there. Um, house of the Tenth Meridian, secretive house growing rich from brokering information and deals. So yeah, you can uh, PCs could be members of these uh, Meridian houses. They could be working against the Meridian houses. Uh, they could be insurgents trying to take them down. Um, maybe all of the PCs were members of various Meridian houses and are working together uh, to end it all. Uh, the Enders. The Enders are a rumored group of individuals interested in discovering or inventing a way to permanently kill the Tarrasque. Now, supposedly the Enders don't exist. And of course, the whole point is the Tarrasque is still alive. So yeah, you can include that, but actually, and that could be a quest for the PCs to finally kill the darn thing. But I guarantee you're gonna, you're gonna create a riot, right? I mean, they will kill you as heroes if you kill the Tarask because that would kill the, the economic viability of the city in the first place. Um, you would literally take people out of power. So um, here we go into like the, each of the Meridians and their rights um, and privileges, how to join them, you know, the crimes against them, uh, blood merchants, all that kind of business. There's gangs and organized crime, of course, notable organizations such as the Kin of, Kin of the Stav, Friends of the No One, Paving Stones, the Thirsty Dogs, the Correspondents. So uh, there's notable criminals and a bunch of their names. There's the Circle of Release, which are like, they wanna release the, the um, there's like a Druidic, Druids in this world are like assassins in a way, kind of cool. Um, <laughs> Vince says you would need a, tons of acid and a wish spell. Hell yeah, uh, that might be a that would be a quest in and of itself to to kill the Tarask, you know. Um, despite everyone 
basically they'll, they'll try to kill you if you try to kill it right um there's religion uh, a religion of course has grown around the tarasque which makes perfect sense right Here, here's a thing that has basically reshaped society um and why people hey we got people who who uh worship the almighty dollar in this world so why wouldn't they do that to, to the tarasque so there's um the monad i believe they are of the of mutations um and there's a mass effects god of butchers mass effects um septum um sola sola terimus sola terimus the holy writ of coin everlasting yeah god of god of coin uh scott says uh the trask is a protected species of, of course the druids must protect it yeah exactly i mean it, it, that makes that makes a lot of sense despite the we consider it destruction because it's destroying where we live but the druids are like well don't live there let the tarask roam free it's a it's a living creature right um if they if the druids and rangers ever find out that the thing might have eggs inside of it or it's per or i don't know if they're eggs it, it could be a mammal but anyway if they find out that it's pregnant at all that would be that would be a huge huge problem um because they would definitely want to find some of the little babies and, and release it there's the Tarrasque and maybe a painting from the, the Great War when they tried to take it down. Uh, there's the history of the binding. Um, also something I didn't mention is the fact that uh, during the war, when, when the different nations to combine together to kill it, the Tarrasque killed probably tens of thousands of people. And so there are huge fields where a lot of those people have not been laid to rest. So there's a there's um, the problem of the undead as well. Um, here we have um, more into the timeline of what had happened during the war. Uh, some of the people that were important in the war, some of them may, be, may still be alive. Some of the things that happened to a number of the, um, the, the, the nations that joined in and what happened to them, um, the founding of some of these um, the founding of some of these organizations, such as the Enders, the Artifacts War, the Meridian Crisis, the Circle of Release was founded. Um, uh, Vince says, if that's a mammal, they would uh, they would sell its milk. Oh, nasty. Yeah, I, 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 I would have to say this Tarrasque probably looks more uh, lizard like it is more reptilian looking, but that doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, if it's if it's a mammal and it it has its milk, oh, all the alchemical things, yeah, drinking that terrasque milk, mm -mm -mm. bowl of cereal, terrasque milk. So, uh, we have secrets and intrigue, and this is where we get into many of the secrets of what's going on. Now, here we say, um, uh, players. You know, basically, don't read this part, but we're going to go through it anyway. Um, the following information is uh, generally unknown to player characters and the population of salt and wounds at large. And of course, um, like on page between page two and six, it at, the writer even says, anything a player reads in this treaty, if a game master tells you something and it it is in congruent with what the player reads the game master is correct you can change anything in here and they actually say that so yes i know some players are like well that's not that that um faction doesn't exist in this world well yeah i made it up so it exists right and uh, the person who wrote it jm perkins says yes it is true if you as a game master make up something or say something doesn't exist or change something um and it goes in um contrast to what the players read then what you say is true <laughs> the last Jedi, green milk. Uh, secrets of the Trask. So here we go into some of the secrets about things like, uh, you know, is it pregnant? Um, six house secrets, all the house secrets that they're holding. Um, definitely, essentially story seeds, right? You can you can build off of all of these secrets and what they know or don't know. Um, the internal strife. So if you want to have player characters that are all from one Meridian house, they might know about these secrets or discover them or be, or have to keep these secrets from everyone else. Secrets of the Ender Cult, uh, secrets of the Cap Caps, which are underneath the, uh, underneath the city, uh, the Blood Merchants, ooh, here we go. Um, 
uh, Tusca and the Quest for Divinity, um, you know, extra planar creatures, the command words and the releasing of the Tarask, um, the command word processors. Uh, those command words are passed down from um, as safeguards, confirmers and safeguards. Um, you, maybe people might try to find the command words to release it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, they did hide something inside the kaju. Dum, dum, dum. You know, that'd be cool. Here are the uh, 13 command words as follows. Um, note these words can be pronounced in their original language for fantasy flavor. They are as follows. So these are the 13 command words uh, right here and the original pronunciation. Boop, 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 boop. I'm not going to go through them all. But yeah, uh, the command words uh, Secrets of the Circle of Release. Um, releasing the Tarask and the, maybe the quest to do that, the Alchemist War, uh, Secrets of the Oni, which are like, you know, Oni are like spirits that live in and around the area and are, are, have been mutated or modified by it, or maybe they want the Tarask to like leave. <laughs> um, monsters and Hazards, there's other creatures. There, there's a half-orc, half-orc alchemist. That looks kind of cool. Uh, or I would say alchemist, yeah, whatever, kind of cool. Um, Animated objects, harpies, uh, uh, flocks of harpies around it. Ank eggs are, are pretty nasty. Um, the God butchers are trying to get rid of them. The Oni, Otiogs are pretty are, are pretty plentiful. Um, axe beaks, ghouls and gas, sturges are nasty. Um, they're fat and bloated. They're giant size yeti, who, which have uh, lived in the mountains, like blood yetis. Uh, uh, Rickard says, uh, what if the magic of the command words is helping to keep it alive? So to, to kill it, um, so to kill, kill, it has to be released. See that, see that there you go. Right. It, it could be, it could be that no one knows that. Like they think that if you, if you say the command words, it'll release it. And really what the command word is it, like, it'll kill it. That, that might actually, that's a pretty cool, cool plot. Um, because if you start to get the command words, you can, you know, uh, destroy this entire economy, man. It's pretty, pretty nasty. Um, al alchemy testing apparatus, apparata, apparati, <laughs> uh, testing apparatus, tiny construct. Yeah, it's pretty nasty. Basically, it's a, it's a, um, e it can wrap around something, and you can test out some of your alchemical things without it um, hurting you. Um, goblin worm tongue. Goblin worm tongues are pretty nasty because they, they're basically like. They've been drinking some of the blood and eating some of the flesh. Uh, Vince says, would it uh, would be neat if you could release parts of the Tarasks so you could use it uh, to tail whip someone away, for example? Uh, I think that tail whip would, well, it'd probably be like a siege weapon, maybe. Uh, colo birds. There we go, colo birds. Pretty nasty picture there, I like that. Um, dire colo birds, carrion smell, blood beaks. Um, ledgerman astral forms it's cool it kind of kind of a weird I, I i love the um I, i'm sure they use this as like stock footage and, and bathing but it's funny that they're wearing like derbies that's cool um a remora fleas fleas are a big deal as well yeah they're that's probably the size of a dog or something man um the red leech tide blood is power yeah, leeches are probably like as big as your your forearm. Uh, Tarask flesh golems, be nasty as well. Some creatures here. Um, what page are we at? Eighty eight. We're getting down here. Uh, worm mothers. Uh, you know, cesspools kind of thing. Paralyzing tentacles. Um, a worm savant. Look at that. There's a face on it. That's, ugh. Yeah, we need to kill that stuff. Um, and then if we got the appendix, Gothmark's grub, grub house <laughs> and um, some like story ideas, some adventure level things, uh, backgrounds and stuff. So here we get into like locations. Um, maybe you want to use them as a place for your PCs to meet up at. Here we have like a little map of what's going on, um, what's there, um, ending the adventure and foreshadowing. We also have salt and wounds, the wider world and, and Sonoma. And so if you want to use this in this particular world, Oh, here's a great picture right here. Uh, this is a god butcher with probably a horn blade and his arm replaced by um, uh, by the, like, uh, not replaced directly by the Tarask, but like grown and mutated so it could replace his arm here. It's, it's you can see like it's wound, it's 
bound up. So, you know, it's got to, he's got to let it grow in. It might be like a week old, maybe give it a month. It'll, you won't, you know, be, take, be able to take the bandages off. But in the meantime, um, got the blade. And I like the aesthetic too. It's not necessarily um, uh, Tolkien Eurocentric. You can see there's like a little bit of an Asian, uh, Asiatic influence to it, maybe Northern Asian influence. So I kind of like that as well. Uh, and we got some creatures here, random encounters. Here we go with it. Got some random tables for you. <laughs> Neat, I want to play one of them. Yeah, definitely. Um, D6 encounters for the Sages Row. In a bunch of these plate locations, there are uh, encounters. Encounters for the throat, encounters for the tailstones. Boo, 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 boo. Uh, D6 encounters for the Beast Crown District. Uh, for example, here, a trio of bored, fashionably androgynous seventh house courtiers, let's highlight this, uh, speak clearly about their sexual appraisal of the PCs. The GM should instead have them in a discussion of who would win in a, in a fight if the group prefers to avoid issues of sexuality in the game. So there's just little ideas for, for that, um, for encounters. We're page 98 here and we get into the OGL. So this is a, a, a page through review of Salt and Wounds. I'm sure we could, we could delve far, far deeper into this. Um, we have uh, the author and special thanks to Kickstarter backers here. Um, a, a ton of people in here. I, I can't, I don't remember seeing my name here. This is in there somewhere. Um, it's not necessarily in uh, alphabetical order, but yeah, <clears throat> a bunch of people um, help support this. Um, Hey, baby, you too. Love you. Love you. Um, uh, Vince says, it's weird that they have to write something like that. And no, I don't think it's, you know what? I don't, it's a shame that they have to include it, but it is a weird thing to include because nowadays everyone is so like, so hyper to be like triggered by like sexuality and all that kind of business that you have to like, okay, people relax. If you don't want to include this in there, to, I mean, if there's NPCs. If an NPC is an androgynous NPC that's like interested in you sexually, then that's an NPC. It doesn't mean the entire world is like that. Punch the NPC in the mouth if you don't like it, or you know, have some sexual congress with that NPC. Whatever. Um, <laughs> Vincent says they don't write it in for violence each time. You know what? See, and that, you know what? That's that's exactly right. Like it's like, wait a minute. Here we are going, literally going through a book based on butchering a live creature and eating its flesh, but we have to warn people about sexuality. Like, really? You know what I mean? So any, anyway, a shit ton of um, of backers for this. It's been a while. It, it's been a long while in creating it. Um, yeah, Scott poses violence is always more acceptable than sex in America. Eh, it's a thing, dude, guys. So <clears throat> let me get back to uh, to myself here. So anyway, thanks for joining me, guys. You know what? Um, we could re revisit this at some point. Uh, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool things in it. Um, I love, but, but my draw towards it was the simple act of a very simple idea. Well, what if there's a Tarasque, right? You, PCs love the hey, let's just kill the Tarasque. But as a game master, world builder, I love taking something simple what if there was a Tarasque and heroes took it down? Now what? Vince says, do you have topics for next week already? Um, I think you spelled week correctly the first time, by the way. Um, <laughs> I don't, well, I do have in my head uh, um, uh, some things. Uh, one of them was uh, world building. This made me think of world building by simple things. So one idea I had was, because like I said, I'm kind of like, we're getting back into the new new year to world build by class, right? So what if each player class, like barbarian, wizard, bard, whatever, um, was the pinnacle control society? Uh, what if what if like more than 50% of the people, um, the world was was controlled, generated, was part of that class of people, what would the world be like? And I know it sounds kind of simple, like, well, like fighters would just be, you know, it's war or whatever. Uh, wizards would just control everything. But thinking, I, anyway, I work alone and, and I'm in my own head and it made me think deeper. So I was like, that might be a cool idea to go through every, every class and shape the world the way the world would be if that class was in control. Um, 
that was an idea. I could go back to a blood because I never got into that because, you know, that was back in the middle of November when, you know, my, my schedule got changed around. Um, that kind of, uh, Vince says you could make something like this book basically for each monster if you really want. And that's the thing. That's what really got me like, you know, well, what if there was a Tarrasque? Just like you mentioned up front, like what if it's pregnant, which that is, oh, I didn't even get to that. Well, don't worry about it. Uh, that That is one of the secrets. Like what if it's what if it's about to give birth? You come up with these ideas in your head, like, well, what about creating shock troops? What about uh, making little mini terrasses and controlling them? What about a druidic cult that's hiring people to release it? What about, what about, what if, what if, what if? And I love those kind of things, taking something simple, like a terrasque, like a rust monster, like, like beholders, like displacer beasts, like sturges, like zombies, you know, whatever the case may be. I mean, really, um, the Tarrasque aside, zombie apocalypse is exactly what we're thinking of, right? What would the world be like if zombies got out of control? Oh, well, this is what it would be like. You know, when we have The Walking Dead, we've got all the type of zombie movies, that kind of thing. So yeah, Vincent says, what if Monster X was very important for this society? And that's exactly what, how world building comes about, like what if, and then what you do is, you, you start sparking these little ideas and you start creating little factions and people's motivations and, and that kind of business. And one of, one of the, um, the issues I have sometimes with us as role players is we love to get to the end, right? Um, we love to go, well, if there was a Tarrasque, the heroes would just kill it, done, end of story. I love the idea of the middle ground, like, like salt and wounds is the middle ground. Great, the heroes, pinned it to the ground, it's not quite dead, but the heroes are like, we're done, okay, see ya. Yeah, but you're not you're not done yet, it's not dead, what do we do? And so the society built around it, um, and hey, there are these people called the Enders that are like, dude, we're not done killing it. Like, it needs to be killed. And all the people that live around it are like, no, you're not. I love I love the, the awkwardness of having those things happen. Uh, Rickard says, um, there's a problem with magic using classes having to be put in check to get them to not run the show due to power difference, but there's always a way around that. And see, that's my issue, right? We as role players like to say, well, if wizards controlled everything, they would, if, if there were real wizards, they would just control everything. And I'm going, not necessarily. Um, you could poison them, you can assassinate them. They all have their own personalities. Some would hide. There would be rebellions. And yet, sure, magic using people could put down those rebellions, but you put down enough people, there's going to be somebody who's going to put a, put a bullet slash, you know, crossbow bolt in the back of your head because you're killing their own people. Like there's all kinds of intrigue you can use. And then what kinds of magic are there? Would the necromancers take over the enchanters? Would the Trans, the people who are transmuters would they take over the the um dominate the the abjurers or whatever like you have all those kind of things and that's the part i love because why answer it why not just create a world where that exists you know what i mean um scott post says the lullaby society passed down special bardic songs to put it put it back to sleep yeah there there is that um yeah i mean right and then then it's the idea of educating wizards like like, would a wizard want to create their own adversaries by educating other acolytes? Or would the education involve like, yeah, I'm educating you, but I'm also putting a glyph on your forehead. And if you go against me, it, it, I can make the glyph explode and blow your brains out, right? Like, there, there'd be all kinds of stuff like that um, in and around society. Uh, would there be like, would you know with the inner circle of the wizards you have to wear like glyph armbands or neck bands to be around them or something um would spells like invisibility and hypnotism and stuff be outlawed because they don't want to be uh, attacked from behind or something and then you know uh, whatever so we're going into other things and, and my point is while we as players and as as world builders like to get to the very end right if wizards existed or sorcerers existed or if clerics existed, this would happen. There are so many what ifs that I think that really creates a good world. So that's what we're going to do. What, next week, what we'll do is we'll, we'll go through each class and kind of shape the world in each class's regime. If barbarians pretty much ruled the world, what would it be like? If, if bards ruled the world, controlled society, what would it be like? Or not controlled, but influenced society. Um, 
Yeah, Rickard says mage hunts, dead gods, etc. Right. What would if if clerics controlled everything? Would there be people trying to kill gods? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, each class, each day. Yeah, I think that would be kind of cool. Um, I I think there's more to it than meets the eye, especially with the fighter classes because they're kind of boring in many ways. But um, I, I think we can do something with it. Like the fighter classes, we can pull from from our own society. Right. Um, but when it comes to like the magic classes or the pseudo magic classes, we can really like like bards, um, sorcerers might be thrown in there, warlocks, things like that. <laughs> As Allah says, you know, I love the fighter classes. Yeah. So we'll probably do that. Um, <laughs> healing taxes. <laughs> Oh man, Scott poses Bardic Rule equals Dungeons and Dragons the musical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, oh man, uh Bardic rap music. Yeah, you want it, you got it. Come and get it, baby. We're here. All you gotta do is set it, baby. Bards or die. What you really want. <clears throat> what you really want. Sorry, that's a DMX is a bard. Sorry, I had to do that. Anyway, um, guys, thank you for joining me. <laughs> Everything comes down to poop. Uh, guys, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much for being part of uh, this page through review of Salt and Wounds. Um, if anybody wants to revisit this, sure, we might might kind of sort of do that. Um, uh, I thought about doing a review of Art and Arcana, but I'm not going to do that. Just people have done a far better review of that book. But it, but if you're a, a diehard um, grognard like myself, an old head who uh, played everything, don't worry about that. So guys, got, I will see you Monday, nice and early my time, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, thanks for joining RPG with DBJ. I'm out. Guys, check this out later if uh, if able and spread the word. <laughs> All right. Now. Oh, um, love to join you. Okay, we'll do that. Vince, you got it. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. You got it. See you guys. Bye. Mm -mm 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 -mm